So recognizing that many of you aren't clinicians, and even for those of you who are, you probably don't see sarcomas too often, I thought I'd just spend a couple slides kind of giving you a little bit of a background on uh, how we think of these diseases. So uh, sarcomas are actually a family of over 50 different uh, tumors of a mesenchymal origin, so connective tissue. So if you think of bone, cartilage, fat, muscle, when these things turn into cancers, they're called sarcomas. And there's a few different ways you can kind of parse these out to organize them. Some are based on histology, like how do they look, what cells do they look like, um, uh, you know, most closely, um, what's, what's their cell of origin. Uh, others have specific mutations that are um, of an unclear cell of origin, but very distinct uh, translocations or, or, or mutations in the case of GIST. So probably the most well characterized of those would be something like a Ewing sarcoma. So we don't know the cell of origin of Ewing's for Ewing sarcoma, but all of them, nearly all of them have uh, translocation between two genes, EWS and FLY1. So it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. And uh, to help organize these, we have this WHO classification book. This is like a two to 300 page book. And uh, if you kind of go through, it gets very complicated very quickly. So uh, just taking, for example, you know, all fat-derived uh, tumors, we have benign, intermediate, and malignant. And even within these, we have different um, histologies. And then we can look at bone and cartilage, uh, nerve sheath tumors, myofibroblastic tumors, vascular tumors, tumors of uncertain differentiation. And very quickly, you can see how complex this gets. And I'll tell you right now, the biology between all these diseases, you know this just from, you know, seeing what I've shown you, is different for all these different diseases. So it's not surprising when I tell you in a few slides that targeted therapy has really failed uh, for us so far outside of just and a few other histologies, because you know that the biology is different between, say, an osteosarcoma, a liposarcoma, and GIST or Ewing's. Um, so our current clinical management has really been stuck in the same place for like 30 years. So we still do surgery for localized disease and then for, um, for particular patients with high-grade tumors, um, we will often incorporate some combination of radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, for those patients who have metastatic disease, their survival is really poor. For, just for example, for soft tissue sarcomas, the average survival in the metastatic setting is only 12, uh, 12 months. Uh, we're still using adriamycin. It's our best drug, believe it or not. And our response rates to chemotherapy is quite low. So, and I already told you about targeted therapy. So clearly we can do better. And I think what we're going to see, you know, as, as we move forward in the next, you know, 10 years or so, we're, we're starting to really um, look at subtypes of sarcomas rather than trying to lump all sarcomas together and say, what happens when we treat these with mTOR inhibitors or something like that? We're really looking at specific different diseases. And it makes it very challenging from a drug development standpoint and a clinical trial standpoint where you have a very rare disease. There may be 200 cases a year in the United States. How do you develop a drug for that disease? Um, so just something to kind of think about a little bit. So let, let's just take a minute to talk about synovial sarcoma. This represents about 10% of our, our soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, peak incidence is late 20s and early 30s. All these tumors have an interesting translocation between uh, two genes um, on chromosome 18 and, and, uh, and chromosome X, SS18, SSX. And the biology of this fusion protein is, is just starting to be really worked out in the last few years. Um, it, it's known that if you take this fusion protein and you put it into cell lines, it will be transforming, it alters transcription, but interestingly, it doesn't bind DNA. And so how does this work? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, if there's any pathologists in the audience, there's, there's two subtypes if you care. So there's a monophasic uh, subtype where you see these are all kind of spindled, all kind of look the same. And then there's this biphasic kind of glandular forming synovial sarcoma. Um, the, some people think that clinically they behave differently. I, that's not, I don't think that's going to hold out uh, over time. Uh, if, if of interest, um, the biphasics are always, for the most part, SSX1 and the monophasics uh, SSX2. Um, the name synovial sarcoma is a little bit of a misnomer. The, uh, I think originally when they were characterizing this disease hundreds of years ago, they thought it always showed up in the synovium because it was common in joints and in the extremities, but we're, we're learning that this, this has nothing to do with synovial cells. We think it's probably from a mesenchymal stem cell of origin. Um, and this is a, just an example of one of my patients I saw a couple weeks ago with a, a high mediastinal tumor. There's no synovium there. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about some epigenetic reg reg regulators. So um, just kind of high level view here. So polycomb is this, um, this group of proteins um, that uh, works together for, uh, to silence transcription. So there's two complexes called polycomb compl repressive complex two and polycomb repressive complex one. Uh, and they, they, they work to kind of shut off areas of transcription. So the catalytic subunit, the methyl subunit, subunit of uh, PRC2 is EZH2. And this uh, very specifically uh, hypermethylates uh, lysine 27 on histone three. And um, so I kind of think of this as like a uh, machinery to, to sort of uh, si silence lineage development. So in embryonic stem cells, very important, polycomb is laid down, lays down its methylation marks, suppresses transcriptions, 
and keeps that cell in its stemness. And then as, um, as, a, tumor, as, a, as a cell develops into a differentiated tissue, polychomas uh, uh, is removed. These methylation marks are removed, and the cell differentiates. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, if you actually just hypermethylate lysine 27, uh, uh, you can transform cells in vitro. And we're learning that there's many cancers where actually EZH2, through some unknown mechanisms, is actually over up, uh, upregulated, overexpressed. And this is, this is uh, prostate, breast cancer, lymphoma, uh, and, and even some sarcomas as well. So on the flip side, um, there's this uh, uh, com um, antagonistic complex called uh, switch SNF. Uh, uh, sucrose non-fermenter from a, its uh, yeast origins. This is one of five ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers, and um, these are really powerful regulators of transcription. They're, they're thought to like remodel um, the nucleosome, reposition the chromatin, uh, and they can actually even bind promoters. And we're learning that, that, um, that switch sniff is a very powerful tumor suppressor. Probably the best example of this is from this very rare pediatric tumor called malignant rhabdoid tumor. Um, all these tumors actually have biallelic loss of SNF5, and that's thought to drive their tumors. And in fact, in vitro and in mouse models, if you if you uh, conditionally knock out SNF5, you can uh, the mice very quickly will develop uh, cancers. Um, we're also learning that, uh, and then also if you can you can reverse that phenomenon to rescue this. So we're also learning that. Um, uh, other uh, switch SNF members um, are very commonly mutated in, in cancers. There's a nice paper from a, from a couple years ago where um, they actually looked at uh, a number of different tumors in the rates of mutations in members of switch SNF, and it was around 20 percent of tumors, so just a little less than p53. So I think we're going to hear more about this in the future. And probably the last important part that, that I wanted to touch on is, is as I said, is that, that switch SNF is actually uh, directly uh, antagonizes polycomb uh, repressive complex 2. And these are thought to never be in the same place at the same time. It can directly inhibit EZH2 activity and expression through, thought to be through SNF5. So, you know, we have, we have polycomb on the one hand laying down methylation marks to suppress transcription, and then SNF5 as a, as a, uh, a negative regulator of that. And, we, and the thought is these finely fine tuned transcription levels. Uh, to, uh, to, to uh, regulate stem cell programs. All right, so let's bring this back to synovial sarcoma and SS18, SSX. So, um, uh, so there's a few different working models here, and pro there's probably truth to all of these, and we're, I think we're still sorting out some of the details as we move forward. But um, uh, let, me, let me show you where we're at so far. So um, as I said, SS18, SSX is not known to bind DNA, but uh, Sue et al. in 2012 was able to work out that through a transcription factor ATF2, it can actually bind promoters and then recruit in polycomb complex to lay down these hypermethylation marks and suppress uh, transcription. And then Seagal, who's now, uh, during her postdoc, she's now at Dana-Farber, when she was at Stanford, she figured out that um, SS18, so the, the fusion partner of SSX, SS18, is actually a normal part of mammalian uh, switch SNF, also called BAF here. Uh, SNF5 is actually BAF47. There's a few different names for that. And she worked out that the fusion protein can actually kick out wild-type SS18 and SNF5, leading to its de degradation, and thus alter SNF, uh, switch SNF activity. And then the last part is coming back to this model of antagonism that I told you about. The, um, uh, if we lose SNF5 either through this mechanism or in tumors where this is lo uh, lost, such as malignant rhabdoid tumor, you lose that negative regulation of EZH2, allowing for overactivity and um, uh, altered transcription. So the obvious question is now, what happens if you bring in an EZH2 inhibitor, so, so an epigenetic target? Can we, can we reverse this uh, uh, overactivity of EZH2 either recruitment through SS18, SSX, or through overactivity due to dysregulation. Um, so I'm an inpatient person, so I wanted to like, as soon as I knew that these drugs existed, I wanted to get these into our patients. I'm tired of giving chemotherapy, tired of our patients dying. So, um, you know, Epizyme, GSK, and there's a few other companies who have these in development. So we're very eager to get these into our patients. Uh, 6468 uh, is in phase one now. They're only open in France. We were lobbying very hard to get this drug into the United States. Um, but uh, they, they weren't quite ready for that. They kind of felt like that we needed a little more preclinical evidence, which, you know, makes sense um, uh, from a drug development standpoint. You know, as a clinician, you know, we, we want to, you know, give, it, give our patients ample opportunity to participate in these. So nevertheless, we, we uh, 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 were able to set up a material transfer agreement with Epizyme. We obtained one of their uh, uh, other EZH2 inhibitors, uh, 5687, to treat some of our cell lines that we already had in lab. Um, so this is the Fuji cell line, and you can see pretty rapidly with low dose, uh, of, of drug, we could see nice inhibition of this hypermethylation mark. And then when we went ahead and treated a number of our cell lines in culture, 
uh, we see high nanomolar to low micromolar IC50s, which looks really nice for a tool compound. Um, we had this hypothesis that maybe there would be differential activity for the different um, fusion partners. Uh, that doesn't appear to be the case so far. Um, and then just to be thorough, we did some knockdown studies. Uh, this is siRNA, and you can see nice inhibition here, and all these cells for the most part die in vitro. Uh, this is a viral shRNA vector, and we see it nicely over three different cell lines as well. Um, so uh, that was a tool compound. This is the clinical compound. So Epizyme's been doing some of these studies themselves. Uh, they, don't, they don't have all the cell lines we have, but they do have the Fuji line, and we see uh, similar sensitivity here, which is nice. Uh, this cell line, SY2, appears to be resistant through unknown mechanisms. Um, we're, uh, 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 the, the reason for this is, is yet to be figured out. You know, so some, uh, about four or less percent of synovial sarcomas can have mutations in things like H HRAS, so it makes you wonder whether there's a secondary acquired mutation here that kind of, some rasopathy that kind of, you know, takes over the, the epigenetic phenomena. So we'll, we'll see. We have to figure this out. Um, SW982 is an interesting cell line. It's, it's labeled in ATCC as a synovial sarcoma cell line. Uh, we before, performed some PCR on this. It does not have the translocation partner. We actually think this is a liposarcoma, so we're, we're, we're working on some, uh, some additional studies to try to characterize this a little better. All right, so um, moving on to some xenograft studies. Uh, uh, as I said, still very early days, but this is the Fuji cell line. We, have to, we still have to bring the other cell lines into, into mice, but uh, very nicely you see here that uh, with the drug, with or without doxorubicin, uh, uh, the, it inhibits tumor growth, and then when you take, off, take away drug, the tumors will grow. And then we're, we're working very hard to uh, develop more patient-derived xenografts. This is a real um, uh, priority for us in the sarcoma group here. Um, very hard to find synovial sarcoma patients that are the right patients. So many of these patients have been treated extensively with chemotherapy. They may have uh, complicated METs to get to. It's not a simple needle biopsy. Um, and they may have been uh, had lesions that have been, you know, received, uh, you know, 50.4 gray radiation beforehand. So it's like with all that radiation to try to establish a mouse model off that, that tumor, it's, it's not going to happen. So, uh, so stay tuned for those. But these are two models that um, uh, uh, that uh, Epizyme's uh, partner ASI has uh, been working on. And um, uh, what you see here is basically just growth inhibition. So there's, there's some slight progression, I mean, slow, slowing of growth, growth. So we'll see. I mean, we need, we need to do some more studies to see if it's, um, you know, if, if, it, uh, if it's just these two cell lines or if it's more active in some other lines or not. So um, uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on, so, so I, I told you about synovial sarcoma. So all these uh, tumors have this fusion protein and all of MRT has uh, this mutation. You know, this is extremely rare. These are 10% of our tumors. There's actually other sarcomas that have loss of SNF5, also called INI1. Um, we think it's somewhere around 20 to 30% of these uh, malignant myopitheliomas. These are extremely rare patients, but uh, you know, we, we see a few of those in our clinic. Epithelial sarcoma, almost all of them have it, as well as some dedifferentiated chordomas. Um, and uh, I think there's a recent paper about a, um, or a case report of a um, a patient with MPNST who had loss of this as well. So they're out there. You know, will this same biology apply to these other tumor types? Uh, hard to know. We'll, we'll find out. Now, one of our one of the things we've been doing routinely in our in our sarcoma group is trying to perform targeted exome sequencing on our patients who we think are going to be eligible for phase one trials. So the idea is to perform some comprehensive sequencing and try to find a mutation that we can link up with uh, some agent that we have in our phase one group. Um, we we find a lot of mutations, but not a lot of them are actionable. Um, in the in the assay we've been using, there there is some uh, representation of switch sniff. It's not all the genes. It's probably like six of them, and um, we are picking up some uh, mutations. Uh, ATRX, for whatever reason, is very highly represented in lyomyosarcoma, uh, and there are some others. So what do these mean? Do, this, do mutations in other switch SNF members uh, mean that they will also be sensitive to ZH2 inhibin like SNF5, or is it a completely different biology? It's, a, it's a, uh, an area of interest of ours that we, we just haven't figured out yet. So this is, this is something for the, for the future that we're going to hopefully get to soon. Um, we've been kind of working backwards on this, as, on this question. So, um, these are two chordoma cell lines, and you know we have these cell lines in labs. So we're like, why don't we just treat them and see what happens? And uh, you, know, you can see here some some uh, low low micromolar inhibition of this one cell line, but this one's resistant. What's the difference between these two? We don't know yet. We have to go but work backwards and do some sequencing. So we'll see. Um, so uh, just to summarize, to summarize here, so I uh, really wanted to emphasize today that this um, this new hypothesis that synovial sarcoma depends on aberrant uh, EZH2 activity. And, and laying down of this, of this hypermethylation mark. And we think that there's good preclinical evidence now that suggests that reversal of this may be a, 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 
a targeted therapy worth pursuing in this, in this rare disease. Uh, 6438 is in phase one, as I said, in France, and we're currently in discussions with ASI and Epizyme to uh, perform a proof of concept study of, uh, in INI SNF5 deleted sarcoma. So hopefully this will happen in the next uh, 2015 to 2016. Um, there's a lot of lab work to do, um, areas that we're interested in trying to, you know, look at some of the gene targets of this. Um, of, the, of the polycomb complex, we need to work on our mouse modeling. We're very interested in combination studies. Um, you know, as you saw in this um, uh, mouse model, you know, this isn't destroying these tumors, right? So maybe we just need the right combination, and we, haven't, we have to explore that a little further. So stay tuned for that. And um, I think that the, you know, the resistance, resistance story of the cell ion will be hopefully interesting as well. So I just want to thank the Orthopedic Oncology Laboratory, which is co-PI'd by Duan and Fran. Jack's the tech who did most of the experiments that you saw. Uh, Brad, Bruce, Edwin, and Keith gave me mentorship. Heike's our collaborator at Epizyme, and Satoshi did the xenograph models that you saw. And that's it. Thanks.